Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine, and I'm the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. Well, we have another exciting episode today, and we have four members of the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine, class of 2027, coming back to visit um, it seems hard to believe that it was September when we were last together. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> and, and, and you, I know you're all having a blast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that some more. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to do a longitudinal every three-month gathering with, with our group here. Zach's back. Hey, how we doing? Audrey's back. Hi. Austin's back. And Renita. Hi. So what... We're talking about today is we're in the second quarter. Everybody started school in August. And the first quarter, we discussed anatomy and biochemistry and PodMed 1. Well, this quarter, we layered physiology on top of that. And so I thought maybe what we'd do is talk about physiology and the increased workload and how that affected you initially. Uh, maybe that's the best way to get it started. Renita, what do you think about physiology being added to biochem and anatomy? It was definitely a lot more than I had thought it would be. I know that our anatomy credits and our biochem credits went down, so I figured it would all go, but it was a lot more work than I thought it would be. It was hard to stay caught up. I don't think I caught up the entire semester or quarter, but it was hard, but I think it was worth it. Very good. Right, Austin, what was your experience? Um, yeah, so I had a similar approach this quarter. Um, I definitely thought the classes would even themselves out a bit. But um, yeah, physiology was a lot more than I expected, but it's been fun. Um, it's been fun learning more about some of the anatomy we learned and how everything works and kind of integrating everything together. Yeah, I think that's the goal, to integrate uh, the different courses and the, the systems as we go forward. So I'm glad to hear that. Zach, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, I would say this quarter definitely, like, you learn your time management skills the best. Like, kind of your first first semester of, like, school is not terribly overloading, but everything's just new. So you're, like, learning how to study, learning how to go to class if you want to go to class, and just learning your, like, whole life routine now. Like, now adding the most credits that we'll have our first year, it's definitely, like, it's, like I said, your time management skills just have to totally sharpen up. So like I found like for me, just eat, just the balancing everything, doing a little bit of it per day. So it's like, I don't know, like an analogy I like to use is like each class is like a tree, right? So as more lectures you get, that tree grows. But then when you study, you chop down the tree. So eventually, sometimes you'll just be chopping down one tree the whole week because you got that test coming up or you just chop down each tree a little bit per day. So it's just like I said, the time management was the biggest thing. That's a new analogy. How'd you come up with that? Uh, I don't know. I, I got, I got a lot going on in my head. So just like from, I got a lot of metaphors, a lot of just different things about life, but yeah. I like that. I like that. Audrey, your thoughts on physiology. So I was kind of laughing at myself earlier from the last podcast because I was like, oh yeah, it'll be fine. No, no biggie, you know, just do what I do. And it, it was definitely a lot harder than I was expecting. And, um, I realized how much easier I had it the first quarter for sure. Not to be like, not to be negative. I've still had a lot of fun and, and I've enjoyed it for sure. I love the material, but it's like quarter, nice though. Cause like, it's kind of preparing you just to like, like when you have like, when you're, when you have 10 patients in a day and you're behind a little bit and you kind of just got to like prepare for everything. So, I mean, like in the grand scheme of things, like, yeah, it's super time, like time consuming, but it's just to prepare you for your future, like profession. So I think, yeah, it kind of sucks, but like, it's just something you got to do and something you just got to learn. Cause like as doctors, like you got, like you have to know like that internal clock of like, Hey, I'm with this patient for this amount of time, but then I got three more to do before this certain time. So I think it just keeps building up to, to just learning how to manage everything. Yeah. So I definitely had to change my approach because last quarter I was just kind of doing one class at a time. I know I probably shouldn't necessarily advertise that but I was doing that and for this quarter that you cannot do that you will always be way too behind and then especially having two exams in one week like it's just not possible to only study for one class and then have two days to learn for an entire exam that's just doesn't work like that unfortunately so you have to study more and you have to be cognizant of time management but if we unpack that a little more what are the study techniques have they changed Renita, have your study techniques changed or are they the same? I feel like I definitely changed it. I definitely do a overview note sheet now to just like go back through the lecture, go through everything, 
and just make a whole overview of the whole like test. That way I have it for right before the test starts and I can just have it with me and that's like the key. And you didn't do that for the first couple courses? No, I didn't do that for the first quarter, but I feel like it's definitely helped. All right. I thought it was kind of nice this semester too. So like we had another one of our pod podiatric medicine, like specific classes in biomechanics. And so like, this was one of our first classes where we've had like hands-on skills that we've needed to do. So like, especially for our last final, like we just got done with our OSCEs. So like for the people that don't know what that means, that's like our, your observed clinical skills exams. So like, it was kind of nice to like, so like the way I did it, last last week is like we had certain written tests and then certain clinicals tests so it's like you study for your written tests but then you go do that in the pod lab and like actually like practice like you're doing a patient and seeing what type of deformities if there are any so i thought that was kind of nice and it was just like kind of fun too because then i was like hey this is how you actually use that textbook knowledge clinically so i thought like that's another big thing that happened this quarter that what we didn't necessarily have last quarter and that's kind of just another big thing as we kind of move on in our journey of like learning, hey, this is like what it is in the textbook and then this is actually how you use it like clinically. So I thought that was a really, really fun. I, I think in order to keep students' interest, you have to introduce clinical concepts and hands-on experiences, especially when we have that beautiful lab to work mm -hmm. in, you might as well. So I think, well, I think we're dosing you appropriately, but I, I do know that adding physiology was the main thing for this quarter. Austin, how about your study skills, study strategies? Did anything change? Um, so as far as things that have changed, I would say just the sheer amount of content was the biggest change. Um, just dealing with that many chapters at one time and having so many courses. But, um, as far as techniques go, I've changed it a little bit. Um, I'm still using Anki, tons of Anki, uh, mm -hmm. writing tons of decks. Um, I've cut back on the written notes a bit, so I just find it's a little faster, to watch lectures, so that's another big thing. Um, I don't usually go to lecture. Um, I usually just watch everything on 2x speed and do my decks. So yeah, just it's all about efficiency for me, and that's what works for me. So, okay, I want to come back to going to class because that was one of my questions for for this uh, round getting together. Because when time gets crunched, you can listen, you can cut down the commute time, you can double the speed of the lecture. Um, well, we might as well talk about it now. Yeah. You're going to not going to class. Are you? Zach, well, so you like what I was going to say is, is just like the biggest thing now is just learning how to use your time efficiently. So like me in particular, like I don't feel like I learn the best in the lecture hall. I feel like because so like the professors will introduce a topic and then like as you're starting to understand it, they move on. And so like if you want to go back and look at a topic in class, you can't necessarily do that because the, the professors are going at a pretty decent speed because they have to be done and their hour time. So like, I feel like for me, like just sitting at home and like looking at it and doing it at my own pace has been much more effective for me. I think that's the general prevailing thought. Audrey, how about yourself? Study techniques and going to class or not? So for study techniques, I'm actually really similar to Austin. The fact that I have definitely stopped writing a lot of my notes. I used to write every single thing, but it just takes too much time. And right now this, the fact that we don't have as much time is tricky. And then I've been watching the lectures a lot more, like watching them over and over again, because sometimes it gets so overwhelming to look at the slides. But whenever the professor actually says it out loud, they kind of emphasize the more important points. And normally the way that they say it makes a lot more sense than what's written in the slides. Whenever you're just like looking at everything labeled, it gets it gets kind of stressful. But I do love going to lecture. I think it's a fun experience and you're with all your friends and I feel really <laughs> accomplished whenever I go. But I've kind of slowed down on going a little bit. I think you can also kind of like pick and choose what ones to go to too. Like if you're, if you're like really grasping the material for say biochem, but like there's certain things in anatomy you aren't quite, you aren't quite grasping, like maybe you choose to go to those lectures or not. So it's kind of just like, that's another great thing about like the way our program is set up is you can kind of take each class like at your own speed. It's like, if you're doing really good on biochem, you kind of put that to the side until you're really good with physiology and anatomy and biomechanics. So I think that's like the way we've set, like uh, the school has set up the quarters really like benefits the students right absolutely have any of you utilized the office hours with the basic science faculty Anita? yeah so i have gone to a couple office hours but i typically only go whenever i have questions i kind of try to ask my friends for help first before i go to the professors 
just in case it is just an easy question that I had a misunderstanding about. But I haven't utilized it as much as I wanted to. So I'm hoping like maybe ne- for next quarter I do utilize it more. Well, it makes sense if they can clarify something in two minutes that would take you an hour to sort out or if your friends don't know it, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Audrey, have you used office hours at all? I actually never have, but I think that I probably should because I have one of those personality traits where I'll just kind of try to like spend three hours figuring it out and sort of <laughs> just going into office hours. I definitely should have just gone into office hours, but I was just really really insistent on finding the answer (laughs) because then I'm like, what if it's in the slides and I just missed it? So then I, but I know that regardless, they would love to answer the questions and pretty much at the end of every lecture, they say, please come into office hours. Like I would love to talk about this information. So yeah, they're, they're into it. There's no doubt about that. I mean, Hey, you're paying for the professors, so you might as well, (laughs) you might as well use them. (laughs) Zach, have have you utilized office Uh, hours? I don't know. I mean, like, it's kind of like if you have a question about somebody, so like the cool thing is like each, each test, there's like four or five different professors that present their information because they're all like the number one in the world about it. Like we, uh, something I caught on anatomy is like, uh, so the anatomy, uh, the head of the anatomy was saying how like the person that's doing our head and neck unit is like one of the most like world renowned for knowing head and neck stuff. So I thought that was like awesome. Uh, so it's like, yeah, I mean, if you have certain questions about their lectures specifically that you don't like want that you can't understand, it's good to go in their office. I haven't used them in particular cause I haven't really had any questions, but I mean, if you need to, there, that's a great thing that they have is the office hours. It's a good to have it as an option. Austin. Yeah, so um, personally, I've never used the office hours. Um, I usually find everything in the slides, and it's usually pretty complete. Everything I need is there. Um, what I will say is um, I do like Open Lab, which is not necessarily office hours, but the anatomy professors do take time out of their busy schedules to help us and help identify things in lab. And that's really helpful when you're in really crowded areas like the head and neck or pelvic region. I know I went in for an open lab for the pelvic region and our professor was there and she just helped me see all kinds of things that I hadn't previously seen or related and it was really helpful. So yeah, it's great to have input from our faculty. That makes sense. So let me ask you this question. Just, I always get asked when I'm interviewing students, are all the questions on the exams on the slides? I mean, I would say like, like now it's, everything's more integrated. So like, uh, like a question might be part from one lecture, but then the answer comes in another lecture. So I wouldn't say it's as black as white as like each, every question. Like, so I, so for example, like last quarter, there was probably like, if I had a question coming out of the test, I knew exactly what slide to go to, to look at the answer. Now, if I don't, if I didn't know it on the test, I wouldn't know where to look because everything's so integrated. So it's kind of just, like I said, it's just the integration of everything. Right. So it's, it, there, it's not like, there might be some questions that are pretty like first order, but now we're dealing with a lot of like, hey, patient presents with this, what enzyme's wrong or something like that. So that's not as straightforward as, hey, that's in this specific lecture. Oh, that makes sense. Have you all found that to be similar? I think that they do, they do a pretty good job. A lot of the time it is pretty much like, okay, I do remember seeing this, but with things like physiology where you know, there's so many different things going on and so many different factors that are changing. And this is like across, you know, the whole, whatever, how many chapters it was, it's not quite as straightforward, but I would say for the most part, but then again, with, um, with anatomy and our practicals, you definitely can't go to the slides really for (laughs) that. So, but besides that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's talk about the testing center and, you know, going in and the actual taking of the exams at the Arizona College. Um, comments on that, Austin? Yeah, so I remember the first time I went into the testing center, it was a little nerve wracking. Um, it was giving me flashbacks to the MCAT kind of <laughs> rock dirt and you have a little whiteboard and your own little cubicle. So it, it's a little nerve wracking at first, but um, I've definitely gotten used to it. Uh, it's nice because we have earplugs, so you can put those in, you can be in your own little space. Um, use your whiteboard. You can study things right before and write down all those equations you might not remember. But uh, yeah, I really like it. It's really well structured. And, um, you know, we take our exams with the DOs too. So there's a lot of people going in, but it's always really efficient and pretty smooth line. So yeah, I, I like it. Arnita? Yeah, I think my first time going to the testing center was kind of funny because I move a lot when I take a test and when I'm doing anything in general. 
So I might have accidentally kicked the person in front of me during the <laughs> test, and I couldn't say sorry because you're not supposed to talk during a test. So I say the testing center is always a fun time because you never know who I'm going to kick. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, how, about, how about the the little boards that you're writing on now for notes? Do you like that? That's a new Yeah, process. I think it's good. I mean, it's like, like Austin was saying, if there's any little things you want to write down so you don't need to remember it. Like, I mean, my process is usually when I go in, I just start just writing, like dumping information that I think is going to be on the test. And most of the time it's like, hey, I wrote that down and that's the answer on the test. So it's oh, pretty good. So I mean, I like the testing center. Like most people, I mean, a lot of people have like their pre-test anxiety and stuff like that. But like for me, it's like the testing center is basically your step to get to what you're at the school for. And that's being a doctor, being a podiatrist, a DPM. So it's like every time I'm in the testing center, I'm like, sweet, this is like one step on the ladder to get to my final goal. So that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Audrey, what's your experience with the testing center? I think that they make the testing center as cozy as possible. I don't think that it can be super cozy, but they do a good job at providing us with everything that we need, like the earbuds. I always take like a few so that I can kind of like play with them a little bit. <laughs> and they always let you bring in your water and it's super quiet. I think they do a really good job at that. And the people, the proctors are always so nice. Like they're always so happy to see you. And then the other thing I like choosing what room I'm going to be in, because there's like four different rooms or something and there's a big room and a small room. So whatever you're feeling that day. Oh, I like that. Okay, that makes sense. I think now, it like also prepares you for like your board exams too, because oh. your your board exams like and your recertification exams are going to be in the same type of atmosphere. So I think it's really just to prepare you for like when you need to take those. So I think it's awesome. Yeah, like Austin said, it's kind of a flashback to the MCAT, and you're going to be taking standardized tests forever. Boards mm -hmm. Part One, Boards Part Two, Board Certification exams. So that makes sense a lot. So let me ask you this: once you finish an exam and you get the, your grade back. Do you go back and look at the test to know which questions you got wrong, or did you know which questions you got wrong? Audrey's laughing over here. Right, it's just because I talk I talk about this with my friends all the time because I've never gone back to look at an exam. And uh, whether or not that was a good choice that I never do that, I'm not sure, but I'm just weirdly like, I'm just like, I will never go back to look at it. <laughs> and I think it's just because I'll make myself feel bad if I miss something. So I just don't want to ruminate on it. And I just want to leave it in the past. But I do know a lot of my friends who love it. And they think that um, it really helps them because, no, you're not going to have an exam on that same material. But you will realize what types of questions that you missed and kind of understand why you missed them and realize how the professors write their questions. No, that makes sense. Now you, that's not, you're, you're not like most people. Most people go back and find out what they got wrong. Renita, what do you do? So I am the person who goes back <laughs> to every test, and I make sure to review every test because of exactly what Audrey said. I like to see what types of questions I got wrong and how to better take those questions and understand them because sometimes I will just miss that one little word, and it helps me realize for the next test I have to pay attention to that one word, make sure I'm properly reading question to see exactly what the professor's asking. So I do go to every exam review. <laughs> Austin? Um, so personally, I've never gone to an exam review. Um, I don't know. I, I usually come out knowing what I missed. I'm usually angry about it. <laughs> and I talk to my friends and we can usually figure out what the discrepancies were. But uh, it's a good resource to have, especially if you're trying to build that longitudinal knowledge base that you need for boards exams. Um, I know that would be really important if there's something that didn't click. And if you can get that clarified, it might change your entire view on something. So I could see where it'd be really valuable. Zach? Or, uh, exam reviews? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't really gone because I haven't really needed to. But like, it's just tough because like the velocity that we move at, like as soon as you're done with one exam, you got two more on top. So right. it's like, yeah, you can go back and see what you missed, but it's like, I'd, I'd, like me personally, I'd rather just start like looking at the material for the next test. Audrey, that sounds kind of like what you're doing too. Yep. All right. But it's like, yeah, for the most part, like if there is one that like I, I think I got wrong, I, I'll usually go look at my notes right after and I'll be like, uh, I'll be like, sweet, I got it right. Or I'll just be like. So I have a question for you. In the evolution of being a great student test taker, every year in the first quarter when I talk to the students, they say, oh my gosh, you know, I had the right answer and I went back and I changed it and then I, it was the wrong answer. Um, have you learned from that? I mean, what's your philosophy? Do you go with your first thought or do you go back and debate it and change your answers sometimes? Audrey. 
I have this bad habit where whenever I'm taking the test, I just look at the answers. And then if I just read a little bit of it, I'm like, Ooh, it sounds like that one. Oh. So I always have to go back. Sometimes it's just not what they were asking, but there have been quite a few times that I've second guessed myself and I can't figure out one time it worked for me. One time it didn't. So I, I just don't know what to do anymore with that. Now that's an interesting testing test taking strategy. Look at the answers. Do you read the question? I, uh, um, I'll I'm see like kidding. a little bit, I'm <laughs> but I just like to like do it really quickly for some reason. But then I take my time as like go back through the second time. But there oh. have been times where I change. I have to change quite a few because I was just rushing through it because I want to see all the questions and get the whole vibe. Mm-hmm. Make sure you get through the exam and the time allotted and things. All right. That's an interesting philosophy. Renita, how do you do it? So I'm kind of the direct opposite where I take my time my first round because I definitely do change my answers a lot. Or at least I did in high school until a high school teacher actually taught me. Once you put in an answer, if anything, do it in pen so you don't change it. Oh, interesting. And ever since I've started that philosophy of not changing my answers, I've tended to do a lot better in my tests. There you go. And whenever I do do my exam reviews, I have found that the ones that I've changed the answer, I got the right answer the first time around. So that just kind of cements that idea that I just have to keep on and unless I have like some questions marked specifically to go back to I only do like a quick scan to make sure I answered everything properly I guess it's human nature to second guess yourself mm-hmm. absolutely Austin what's your philosophy yeah so um, I in college I was definitely one of those people that like to change my answers because I I always develop scenarios where I'm like, what if the professor actually meant this? And I can sometimes convince myself that something that's totally wrong is right. But um, this quarter, I really have been sticking with my gut on everything, and it's really paid off. Um, usually your first instinct is what's right. There's there's something there. There's maybe subconscious that's kind of directing you where to go. Um, another big thing that I've done on my exams is, um, I remember in college when my professors told me, being really good at taking exams is all about momentum. So if I come across a question that I'm unsure of or it's kind of making me feel all uncomfortable, I'll just skip it and I'll just keep going and I won't let it get in my head. So I just try to make that first pass of the exam questions really fast and efficient. Um, and then on my whiteboard, actually, I'll write down all the numbers that I was really unsure of. And I have a few symbols I'll put by if I kind of know it, if I really don't know it, or if there's just no way. And I'm also going through the exam further. Sometimes we'll give you more context and it might even give you the answer. So um, that's one approach I've been using. It's been working pretty good. So I like these pearls. Zach, what's your philosophy on changing? Yeah, I mean, answers? you kind of just got to go with your instinct, right? Like, I mean, I kind of approach each question as like a patient, right? So like when you're taking a patient history, you're looking for like certain keywords or like to lead you to to like to lead you to your diagnosis, right? So like when I'm reading through a STEM, I'm just highlighting a few words and then I know, Hey, if there's these three words together, it's usually pointing me this way or this way. So I kind of just like kind of just sim through it, look through certain words. And then if I don't know it off my, off the top of my head, put an answer down and then come back to it. So it's, you just, you just got to trust your instincts. I mean, yeah, it's like you said, I mean, a lot of people like will have the, have the instinct to be like, Oh yeah, I put this right answer first, but then like reading again, I second guess myself. So it kind of, you just got to be confident and trust your instincts with it. Right. And like Austin said, you can't turn it around and say, well, maybe the professor's asking me something that I'm not seeing. Yeah. yeah that's usually not the case. Right. And that's great. That's some wonderful pearls there. Thank you very much. Um, so when we were talking about getting together today, I, you gave me some ideas of questions. Uh, one of the questions was, what is one thing that you've learned this quarter that you didn't know the first quarter? Well, something that happened to you or um, something academic or non-academic? Audrey? I'm really not sure. I feel like I should maybe think about that for okay. another then second. Then we'll put you on the Sorry. back. Yeah I, can, yeah, I can take it. All right. I mean, like, so I, I honestly had, like, a pretty rough go this first, like, so my first semester was awesome. Like, but the start of my second semester, I was just, like, I had, like, my all-in moment. So, like, I feel like students, like, uh, you get to that point where it's like, hey, I know no matter what, this is what I'm doing. And like the beginning of the semester, I kind of was having second thoughts. I was like, dude, is this like really what I want to do? And like my first, like this first semester was like pretty rough for me. But like then just like looking back at it and looking at everything, I was like, yeah, like there's nothing else I want to do besides this. So it's like, yeah, I'm getting, I don't know, emotional here. 
But uh, well, you know, it must have been long because it was a quarter, not a semester. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must yeah. have seemed long. Yeah, no, but I mean, yeah, you kind of just get to that all in moment where you're yeah. like, hey, this is like exactly what I want to do. Uh, <laughs> I love it. That's great. I like that story. <laughs> Austin. Um, I mean, this quarter taught me a lot, and I mean, we're still in it, but um, I think a big thing that I learned was uh, by a lot about biomechanics. So my father's always told me that biomechanics is like the cornerstone of podiatry and being a great surgeon. And I never really knew what it was. And uh, this quarter, um, I kind of went in blind to biomechanics, not knowing much about it. But uh, after learning uh, more and more about biomechanics, uh, it really showed me how integral it is to the profession. So that was something I was not really aware of and just kind of hit me out of nowhere and yeah, but I loved it. It's great. Great course. You kind of give lip, ser- lip service to biomechanics until you get into it and you understand it and you're like, oh, the light goes on. Ren- Renita, how about yourself? So I think the main thing I learned this quarter is um, what to do when you get burnt out because okay. I definitely got burnt out. I think maybe even like midway after Thanksgiving break and then partway after winter break. I just didn't want to keep going, but I found that I could just depend on my friends a lot more and share how I'm feeling because most likely we're all just dealing with it and no one really wants to vocalize it too much. So just being able to share that and kind of bond with each other and kind of work through it, it really helps you not be burnt out anymore and actually make it to the finish line. That's interesting you say that because it's kind of the medical way, right? They're getting you ready for... Like you were saying earlier, Zach, you're going to have a lot of patients and uh, you're going to get a consult in the ER and you've got a case after in that evening and you've got patients in the hospital and you have a clinic full of patients. You got to juggle all that and you got to give every instant uh, all of your attention. So I think, uh, I think that's a common theme, especially in the first and second years of being like, oh my gosh, this is a lot and I'm tired. And <laughs> you know that you know, the end game is great, but um, it's a process. And, I, and like I said, I think it's kind of the medical way. Yeah, I think like this semester, you definitely learn like, hey, you you like have to take breaks. Like you have to take care of yourself because like if you just try to like do it like all the time, like even if you love it, it's it just gets a lot, right? So like you have to figure out like, hey, I need to take a break just to give myself and give myself like a brain break and stuff like that. So all right, well, let's talk about the breaks in a second because I wanted to circle back around to Audrey. Um, what did you learn this quarter uh, after reflection? Thank you. So uh, kind of along those lines, I realized how capable we all are. And I was thinking about it, the fact that for our first anatomy exam, I remember that we were given a few of the major arteries and a few of the, the major veins. And I thought that this was just wild to have to learn for our first exam that was coming up in a few days. I thought that it was crazy. It was so much material and it wasn't possible. <laughs> And now I look at my slides and I see that there is way more information, but I don't feel discouraged anymore. And I know that, you know, the school knows that what we can handle and they know that we're capable. And so it's just, it's interesting to look back on and the fact that I thought that that was crazy and it ended up being okay. And then now I have so much more material and I feel so much more confident in it, even though it's, it's so much more. Confidence is a fickle thing, you know. It's like, didn't Henry Ford say, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> so being confident has a lot to do with success. It's kind of a snowball that rolls up. Um, and let's go to the next topic. You brought it up. You can't study 24-7. You got to relax. You got to recharge your battery. I know we talked a little bit about this last time, uh, but the busier you are, the more you need those breaks. Austin, what do you do to kick back and relax? So the weather has been amazing right now. Um, I, I just went mountain biking like two days ago, and it was like in the high 60s. It was perfect weather. And it had just rained too, so it, it was so fresh outside. But uh, I do a lot of mountain biking. Uh, it gets me outside. It's fast-paced. I don't have to think about anything else, you know. But sometimes I do think about <laughs> the muscles and biochemistry. <laughs> yeah. But um no, I, I do that. It really helps. Exercise is great for your mental health and getting out. You know, I wish I could just go for eight hours just doing all my onky decks, but it's not sustainable. And you really do have to find what's sustainable for you because I don't know, that first quarter I was probably burning out every two weeks. You know, it's just, it's something you get used to that maybe you shouldn't be used to. Um, it, it's definitely been normalized in the medical professions, but um, taking those breaks and time 
for yourself is so important. And, um, you know, when I come back after a break, like after going out, uh, I'm just, I don't know, I'm refreshed and I can hit the studies with so much more efficiency. That makes sense. Makes sense a lot. Zach, what do you do? Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's funny. So, uh, like, growing up, I used to say I just, like, never liked playing golf. Like, I just thought it was, like, a dumb sport. I was like, I cannot believe people do it. But, like, then, like, in medical school, like, my biggest break is playing golf. So, like, I love it. So, now it's just funny how, like, it switched in my head. But, like, yeah, no, I love playing golf as, like, a good break because it's a good mix between, like, exercise and relaxation. So, yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. Like, when I'm not in my notes or textbooks, I'm on the golf course. Well, if you're playing golf, you can't be thinking about too many other things. Yeah. Because you can only be so much frustrated. Yeah, no, I don't know. It's <laughs> kind of starting as frustrating, but now it's like, and then in my backswing, I'm like, oh, I know this muscles are doing this. Oh, so it's, it's kind of like you get a mix of a little bit of both. So yeah. it's nice. Yeah. And you're analyzing everybody's gait. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know. Me and my friends are super competitive too. So it's a good way to, to get the competitive juices flowing too. I like it. Audrey, what are you doing to recharge your battery? So I've actually started playing golf as well. Oh, you have? And that's been very fun. I'm not very good at it, but I have a lot of fun just being (laughs) there. I love being outside. Um, But I think a big part in kind of preventing the burnout that I especially got the first quarter was prioritizing sleep a lot. And so I think last quarter I would try to stay up late because I, I thought it was being so productive and good for me for staying up and studying. But in all reality, I wasn't really getting any information because I was so tired. And then the next day would not be fun. And it just kind of like snowballed. So I think now I'm really prioritizing like at like 9 p.m. Like that's it. I don't study anymore. and I'm going to sleep. I go to sleep really early. So and then golf. I like that. We'll come back and talk about sleep in a minute. Renita, what do you do to, to relax and get yourself ready for another round of studying? I definitely find myself being really social. I don't like to be alone at all. So recently we've actually been doing like friend dinners where we all just make dinner together and then we eat together. And it's refreshing because when you're cooking, you can't really study or even talk about school because we don't want to burn the food, right? Right, right. (laughs) But um, that has definitely been a nice break from studying because it's a solid hour or two where you just get to spend time with friends doing nothing essentially. Very good. Are you a morning person or an evening person? I think I'm a little bit of both. I think I might switch between the two because sometimes I find that I'm very productive in the morning, but other times I just can't stop studying at night because I feel like I could go on forever. (laughs) That's a gift. Kind of. Kind of. (laughs) Austin, are you a morning person or an evening person? Uh, Right now, probably an evening person, Um, unless it's the morning of an exam. Those, those mornings kind of force you to get up and, you know, review everything you can. But, uh, yeah, I, I like the evenings. It's nice and quiet. I have a nice window I can look out and, you know, enjoy the quiet evening and just study. So, yeah, right now I'm an evening person. That morning or evening? I do a little bit of both. Do you? Yeah, I mean, I kind of just try to prioritize, like... I try to just prioritize the things I need to do in my day as like a break. So like I'll wake up, have breakfast, start studying, and then it's like, oh, I need a snack. We'll take a break. So I kind of, I don't know, I do a little bit of both. There you go. Audrey? Definitely a morning person. I mean, I go to sleep so early, so I feel like it would be strange if I wasn't a morning person because I'm not an evening person. So I chose mornings. No, I'm I'm just like you. I mean, if I've got something to do, I can get up at three in the morning if I have to, or four or five, but then I run out of gas at the end of the day and I'm going to bed at 9 or 9.30 or something. So everybody's different. That's why I asked. And everybody seems to make it work. So so that works out pretty darn good. Um, so golf is the ticket, huh? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, we've been going to the range uh, as our friends and stuff too. So we try to see who hits it farthest. So her boyfriend's got the lead right now, but me and a couple of dudes from our class are trying to beat it. So Very good. Well, you know, um, when we go to meetings, uh, the dean's meetings are at the – APMA meeting and the ACFAS meeting. A few of us deans all get together and go golfing. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. And uh, again, when you're golfing, you can't be talking about all the things that are pertinent to the job, yeah. right? So you get to know people as people, not just as colleagues and 
That's good, yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, There's a reason golf is popular. It's a good way to connect people, too. It it is a good way. So let me ask you this. Uh, What are you doing extracurricular-wise? We've talked a little about what you do to relax, but within the school, when involving the profession, the different clubs and things, are you guys getting involved yet, or are you kind of laying in the sidelines? Yeah, I mean, as a first year, like there's not a ton of things you can do in terms of leadership and stuff like that, but you can definitely go to a lot of the club events. Like uh, I know ACFAST, which is the surgical group we had just done a workshop where we were doing like suture techniques and and, uh, casting techniques so I thought that was really fun like a good way to take a study break and again see how this actually applies clinically so I thought that was good that was a good event they put on very good yeah Audrey so I've also been to that workshop it was a ton of fun um I also went to the special olympics that was over in where was that Tempe in that area um and a little bit of ultrasound group they needed models for to be ultrasounded on the other day. And so I volunteered for that. And that was really cool to see, you know, how physicians do it, who have been doing it for a long time and, you know, just listen to everything that they were teaching them. It was really, really cool to see the continuing education. The the clubs kind of bring theories and what you take on tests and make them real, you know, when you start doing case scenarios and things. So it makes, it makes a difference. Austin. Yeah, so I'm not really in any clubs right now. Um, I know ACFAST is great, and I definitely had my eye on them at the beginning of the quarter, but I'm kind of, I'm probably going to save that until probably second year. Um, I've just been so busy studying. But um, yeah, no, the clubs are great. I always see their emails that they send out, and uh, we get a lot of emails from the DO groups too. So uh, you can participate with them too. That's great. Um, it's great to have that invitation. Um, what I am interested in extracurricularly, though, is uh, definitely research. Um, I'd love to start research either this spring or summer. So that's something I'll be keeping my eye on. You saw this year we're including the first years in the student-initiated research project. So hopefully we can work together yeah, on some of those. Um, something tells me you're, you're a social butterfly and you love doing things together with your classmates. Yeah, so... <laughs> I did do the Special Olympics thing as well, and it was so much fun. I really enjoyed the event and working with Dr. Jenkins in that and just learning from him as well. Um, And as Austin was talking about, we do have the ability to work with the DOs. So um, I think I forgot the name of the specific fraternity. Sorry. But um, they also do volunteer at St. Mary's Food Bank. So me and a friend did end up go volunteering last quarter. And I think they should be doing another one soon at the end of this quarter. So hopefully I get to go again. But I definitely enjoy volunteering as part of an extracurricular. Makes sense. Another way to relax. And yeah. Very good. So I, I can't end this without asking you one academic question. Um, you had your in, inaugural biomechanics uh, course and you had the ASCII, as you said. Um, tell me one thing about biomechanics that you know today that you didn't know three months ago. Renita. The first ray range of motion. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I really enjoyed that one. And I had no idea the pads of my thumbs were 10 millimeters. Okay. And I every day I look at my thumbs and I just imagine a ruler there. And I am still amazed. And I will forever thank Dr. Toms for teaching me that because I think that might be one of my favorite fun facts from the course. Well, I'm glad I asked. Yes. Thank you. Austin, how about you? Um, I just thought it was really amazing how many axes are in the foot. Um, you usually think about the ankle joint and then maybe that's it. I don't know. Some people probably look into it more than I do, but, um, yeah, we've learned so many axes and there's so many rotational movements going on and then the physics come into this and then weight bearing and it's just amazing. And it shows you that there is such a need for podiatrists and people who understand this stuff in depth because, a lot of people downplay the foot. I know um, I've always heard stories of other medical schools where they literally skip the anatomy of the foot sometimes because um, they're like, oh, we, we let the podiatrists or the ortho bros do that, you know. Um, but yeah, just learning the complexity, how everything has to be, you know, uh, everything needs to be aligned correctly for the foot to function. So it, it's, it's kind of blown my mind, but yeah. I like that. Audrey. I definitely know the subtalar joint axis now. There you I go. know that's similar, but that's neat that I know those specific numbers. I'm happy about that. Very good. You know, Dr. Kevin Kirby, he's a, a very big sports biomechanics uh, doc in California, and he did one of the fellowships at the California College, and he spent so much time looking at the different the axis of the subtalar joint and how it affected the foot. I learned a lot from him, and I agree with you. That's one of the most important things we can learn. 
Is that yeah, I mean, I, at, at the beginning, I didn't necessarily like it, but now I think it's awesome because it's like, it's very definitive. Like if somebody has a forfeit varus or forfeit valgus, you can see it. Whereas like with most pathologies, it's not necessarily as clear to the eye. So I think it's awesome because like, like now I can watch somebody walk and if they've got a limp or something, I can be like, oh, I know that I got to change this, this and this about them to make them feel better and walk better. So I just think I love it because it's like you can look at it and know exactly like, hey, I don't got to worry about doing a blood test. I don't have to worry about doing an ultrasound. I can see it visually and I know, hey, I got to do this to fix this. Right. So I think it's awesome. You know, when I was learning biomechanics, I was always thinking about the, the Tahamaran Indians in Mexico, how they do those 1,500 mile races barefoot. And it makes you appreciate how the foot can be a mobile adapter. Mm-hmm. It can adapt to the terrain and then it can quickly turn into a rigid lever to propel you forward. And I thought, when I always thought about that because it really made sense in the, um, the phases of gait. And uh, so the, the, the foot is amazing, right? It's t- truly a remarkable piece of engineering. You, you got to love it. You got to love it. You got to love it. All right. Um, any last words? I'll give you each uh, last comment. Audrey. Thank you so much for having us. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, we're going to do it quarterly. So um, I like the discussion and get some good topics going. Renita. Yeah, I had a lot of fun being here and talking through these questions. But, well, this is kind of a break from studying for you. Yes, very good break. There you go. Z- Zach. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of on our home stretch of before finals here. So we got three tests coming up in the next seven days. So it's a good time to kind of just come and decompress. So we appreciate you having us. No, I'm glad you could make it down here. And Austin. Yeah, uh, I'm really excited to start the spring quarter in the summer and uh, really delve deep into more podiatric specific courses. And uh, yeah, thank you again for having us. It's been great. You're so welcome. Um, I I wanted to make sure we do this quarterly and it, it, it always surprises me how fast three months goes by. So we'll continue to meet, follow your journey through the podiatric medical education world. And I do appreciate all of you coming down. And for all of you listening on Spotify or Apple Podcast, uh, we appreciate you listening. Please give us a five-star rating. And if you're watching on YouTube, please become a subscriber. And until three months from now. Three months, baby. All right. Cheers, everybody. Woohoo. Bye-bye now.